All righty. Hey, Howard Parent Connect. We are going live again for December and um, we are going to give you a few seconds to log in, to connect, to let us know where you are connecting from in the chat. And then we'll get started with the introductions and we'll go into questions. So come one through, grab your dinner, grab your dinner tray, wherever you go to eat and fellowship, <laughs> come through. And I'm going to keep my eye on the on my phone because I know that that's where you guys will drop a lot of chat. Let's see. Going live right, again. I'm through. Mute this down. Awesome. Come on through. I see some of you guys coming in. We'll give you another minute to get in here. And just let us know where you are logging in from. Awesome. Okay. All righty. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, this is a Dr. Jarita Higgins, and we've been chatting via email for a few weeks uh, to um, engage her and what's going on at um, uh, with you guys and how our parent connect and um, asking her to come through and address some concerns and questions that we have uh, for our parents um, and to help you help your uh, bison thrive in the place that they are um, being schooled and in this new city for many of them this is a new semi-independent experience for them and we want to make sure that we keep bringing new faces to you guys to help you support your young bison. So um, welcome to our December live sessions. Um, we're discussing preparing your bison for illness and medical emergencies. Um, so what we do know is that moms and dads um, who actually still think of themselves as the protectors and advisors, even after their children become legal adults, uh, often don't consider the real world implications of that milestone birthday. 18 years old, they and, and their children need to think about the unthinkable in advance, especially when our kids are leaving for college. So today I'm introducing Dr. Jarita Hagens, and she's a board certified family physician. She's a foodie, my favorite kind of person, an author <laughs> and an artist. Uh, she attended Howard University in Washington, DC for undergraduate and medical school. She has worked at medical offices in Washington, D.C., as well as Baltimore and several other Maryland cities. She is the founder of Zion Family Practice, LLC, offering in-person and telemedicine visits in Washington, D.C. We will have her full bio available to you in the group page under the files um, tab. So if you want more information, please visit um, that tab. Uh, she is the author of MD Dreams, Practical Advice for Every Stage from Pre-Med to Residency and Beyond. Women Who Lead, Extraordinary Women with Extraordinary Achievements. And that's a collaborative book that she co-authored with 21 other fabulous women. And her third book, Good Food Now, again, my favorite topic, recipes and tips that will save your time and sanity. We all need this in our lives. Even if you don't have time for that, it's available 
currently on Amazon um, for Kindle. And Dr. Hagens is also the author of three children's books, Maya and the Golden Chess, Mason and the Magic Cape, and Kid Astronaut Space Dreams. Um, our live will again focus on exploring situations that requires an emergency boom visit versus self-care resources in the DC area to help your students during a health crisis and three important forms that will help facilitate the involvement of a parent or other trusted adult in a medical emergency. So I want to thank you for joining us, Dr. Hagens. How are you this evening? I'm doing well. <laughs> Happy awesome. to be here. Wonderful, wonderful. So as people are coming through, um, just drop in our chat, where are you um, viewing from so that we can have a good idea where all of the parents are at this evening. Um, but I'm going to um, give Dr. Hagens an opportunity. If there's anything that I missed um, in your introduction, um, is there anything else that you would like to share with the parents? Um, nothing that you missed in my introduction, <laughs> but I just want to tell a quick story. Every parent always thinks that if they haven't heard from you, that you're dying and bleeding on the side of the road and somehow can't reach them. <laughs> I was a grown adult and in medical school and my parents hadn't heard from me for a couple of days. I didn't call them on my check-in day because finals were coming up. And my father came up to the school, made them open my apartment and checked to see if I was in there and left a note on like my inner door. And I came home, it was a note on the inside door. And I was like, did he come here? <laughs> but, he get in? <laughs> they let him in, he made the landlord let him in. <laughs> oh, that's so wild. You know, that's funny because just today, and if my daughter is anywhere on the web right now, and she's probably listening in and gonna affirm this, just today, I emailed, I texted her like five times. Where are you? Like, where are you? I haven't heard from you. And I was just about to text her boyfriend. And all of a sudden, she sends me a text message. And she's like, I'm OK. And I text her back, well, take a photo of yourself with your eyes crossed and send it to me <laughs> so I know that it's you texting me. And she goes, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so you're weird. <laughs> So yeah, we do get super worried when we don't hear from our kids. And for me, it was only 12 hours that I hadn't heard from her, but I was panicky. So, um, so yeah, so, you know, we're just going to talk about a, a little bit about some of the um, things that we should uh, consider when we're preparing our young uh, college students leaving uh, to go to college in terms of mer emergencies and, and illness. How to prepare for them? What's the difference between something that needs to go, you know, that you would need to go to the ER for versus something that you should be able to open up your cabinet and do some self care um, or call your grandma, you know, to get that that home remedy. And um, because we want to reduce the cost um, and, you know, reduce the time that is in between the moment that you feel that an emergency is happening and the time that you can get um, care. So knowing where, how and where to navigate these spaces um, in this new area for many of our kids who's traveling from all over the world, you know, to attend, you know, not just Howard University, but campuses all over the country. So, you know, from your medical experience and just, you know, your, your time spent in your field, what do you think are some typical emergency room visits that you've seen or heard um, made by college students? So I think that people aren't sure the difference between different levels of care. Um, so I have my own office, but then I also work in an urgent care. And I mm -hmm. find that some people are coming to urgent care for things that are actually emergencies. Mm -hmm. Like, ooh, that person shouldn't be here. Let's call 911. Mm -hmm. So what are those things? Um, chest pains, one. Mm -hmm. Now, if you already know that you have some sort of muscular condition and you think it, it's just a flare up of that, that you can go to the student health center for or to the urgent care for. But if it's a brand new chest pain and it's never happened before and it doesn't go away in a few minutes, emergency mm -hmm. room. Right. Um, yeah. If you're short of breath, same kind of thing. Like if you know you have asthma and that's what it is and there's wheezing and it's similar to your previous asthma attacks, um, mm -hmm. use your inhaler. If you've mm -hmm. used the inhaler and it's not working, go to the emergency room. If you've never had shortness of breath, like what you're having at the time, 
emergency room because you don't know mm -hmm. what that is. Unlikely to be a heart attack in somebody who's in college, but you have other things that are dangerous, like blood clots in the lung. Um, and now we have to worry about COVID mm -hmm. <laughs> and other types of pneumonia. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Third thing that's an emergency room visit is abdominal pain that's not going away, stomach pain. Mm -hmm. um, that could be any number of things. And the reason why you don't want to go to a regular doctor's office or go to the urgent care for that is because most urgent cares only have plain x-rays. And these are the type of things um, that require other types of imaging that are available in emergency room, like might need a CAT scan or ultrasound to find out if there's appendicitis or uh, ectopic pregnancy or gallstones, things that require surgery. Mm -hmm. And usually okay. the urgent care is not equipped to find that out with their plain x-rays. Okay. Um, lacerations is another thing. Lacerations can go to um, the urgent care. Um, it cannot go to the student health center. I called to find out about that. Like, can they do uh, minor injuries? But I did find out that Howard's emergency room has a fast track area that serves as an urgent care. So they can do... Um, lacerations and minor bumps and bruises and you don't have to go through the regular ER and wait behind all the major stuff they have a little type of urgent care area that, that you would go to for that and the important thing with lacerations is not to wait too long you mm -hmm. need to have that sewn up the same day if you wait until the next day the wound starts to dry in a weird way so that you can't get it closed Okay, okay, okay. So you really so, need to go and, and within like eight hours of being cut if you think that it needs stitches. And the thing that will make you think it needs stitches if it's deep or you see um, like tendons, you see something white that could be tendon or bone, mm -hmm. um, or if it seems like it keeps pumping blood and you can't get it to stop. Okay. So what, you know, have you, have you seen or what do you know of some of the reasons uh, that college students have visited the emergency room in terms of like, yeah, you shouldn't have came here for that. Like, you know, you should have just kind of waited it out or, or are there some common things that you'll find uh, that the students are using the ER for as a substitute for just taking care of themselves because they're panicking? Yeah, so there's actually a wide range of stuff available at the Student Health Center um, that is similar to what your regular doctor could provide, like um, STD testing and HIV testing. Um, I mean, it seems like an emergency if you think you have an STD, but don't go to the emergency room for that. You can get tested at the um, at the student health center, and your records are confidential and things like that. Um, you can get um, immunizations. You can get blood work done. You can get a pregnancy test done. A lot of people go to the emergency room for pregnancy, pregnancy tests test. because they think that the that's an emergency test is somehow, <laughs> is somehow better at the doctor's office than from the CVS, but it's really not. Okay. 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 <laughs> You'll get the same results. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, so we do know that sometimes kids, you know, young people, young emerging scholars in this case, really do panic and they want to know the answers to whatever they're feeling, you know, quickly, um, especially when it's, you know, holiday break time, they're about to go home, you know, something's yeah. changing with them and they want to kind of figure it out before they get home. What, what happens when a student actually visits the ER for non-medical emergencies? Like, is there an, you know, extreme cost? Like, what are some, like, downsides to doing that? So it's possible that um, you would get a bill later on if the insurance company reviews it and decides that it wasn't something that you need to go to the emergency room for and that you could have gone to your regular doctor or to the student health center or what have you. And then the other thing is that it increases your wait time. Mm -hmm. They triage you when you go into the emergency room and find out what you're coming there for. Be like, oh, you're coming here for a rash? You could have <laughs> gone down to the CVS and bought some cortisone cream. Right. You can be number 10. <laughs> right. <laughs> or 20. Depend. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're, we're hospitals are really overwhelmed right now with COVID and everything. So the wait time is incredible. Yeah, that was going to be my, my next inquiry about the, the capacity of some of the medical facilities to even handle these 
what they have determined are non-emergencies. And so that's why it's important for us to educate our, our scholars, you know, the difference between something that self-care or going to CVS or Walgreens to be taken care of versus going to the ER and then kind of bottlenecking that space for real emergencies that are coming through. Um, right. So what are some, uh, or let's talk about the uh, FERPA um, and HIPAA. Um, okay. How does uh, FERPA and HIPAA impact the parent's ability to intervene in their college students' medical care? Okay, so the FERPA is um, basically privacy concerning educational records, and then HIPAA is privacy concerning medical records. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have access to your students' records, you need to have um, documentation for each one because they can't mix the medical and educational records together. It's like a separate um, mm -hmm. document, legal document for that. So okay. what you would need to do um, basically is have a waiver for both of those. So you would need the uh, waiver for the FERPA, for the uh, Family Educational Privacy, I forget <laughs> all the, um, yeah. the, what all the acronyms <laughs> stand for. So you need to have a waiver for that because the school is not allowed to um, basically send or give you access to your students' grades. Even if you're paying for it, they can't mm -hmm. give you access to the students' grades unless they have signed a document saying that you can have access to the students' grades. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that you want to get beforehand and talk to your student beforehand that you're not trying to baby them, but right. you just want to be involved in their education and help them out as much as possible. Same thing for HIPAA. If the, your student goes to the Student Health Center, make sure that they're filling out the HIPAA form saying that um, your parent can have access to your record. And if they feel weird about you having um, access to like their sexual health and STD information, they can put limits on it and just <laughs> say, <Bye. laughs> um, I only want this part to be shown. Or maybe it makes it more, um, they'd be more receptive to it if you put like an end date on it, that it's not forever and ever. Maybe it's just for right. the first just year. This week. Check on <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So that's good. And then so the and hardcore legal documents are the medical power of attorney. Um, but that only comes into effect if um, there's a true emergency. Like, let's say, God forbid, that your child gets into a car accident and they're not able to speak for themselves, then that medical power of attorney, they're going to contact you and you can contact the hospital, get medical information. And then that durable power of attorney is the legal document saying that you can um, help make financial and legal decisions. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the power, so the, uh, the power of attorney and then the durable power of attorney, durable, okay. the medical power of attorney and then the durable power of attorney, durable okay. power of attorney. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, and so what do you think are some key things for a college student to have included in their emergency preparedness kit? Okay. So I don't have kids, but my niece went to college this year. Um, and what I gave her for a graduation gift was a medical kit. Okay. <laughs> I basically <laughs> went and got a big plastic tub from Target and filled it with a whole bunch of stuff. So what I put in there was um, things for pain. So ibuprofen, Tylenol, um, other things that I put in there were things for like stomach upset and diarrhea, like Pepto-Bismol, Tums, mm -hmm. uh, Maalox, and then uh, things for allergies like um, Benadryl and like a lower level allergy medicine. I think I gave her some Zyrtec or something, mm -hmm. um, skin stuff. That's a lot of things that, that's the other thing that um, <clears throat> young adults tend to freak out over if they have a rash or something. Um, so put some hydrocortisone cream in there, some Neosporin. Um, and then wound care stuff. So mm -hmm. band-aids, um, gauze and tape. Um, I think I put a ACE bandage in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just a okay. couple of different things. I think I gave her some heat packs, like the kind that get warm when you tear them open. Because mm -hmm. this stuff can get kind of expensive when you're trying to put your little college coins together. Yes. And then transportation <laughs> might be an issue. You may not be able to get down to the CVS 
safely at the time that you're needing these medicines. So it's nice to have them packed for you. Absolutely. And then when they call you to or text you saying that this is going on, like, hey, go get slushy go in your out kit of your, out of your kit and take it. Absolutely. So I, what I noticed the difference between my son and my daughter. So when I send my son to, to, to college, I sent him with cases of condoms. Number one, that, that was so important to me. I was like, let me, I didn't gotta think have about this. that, but that's, that's important. <laughs> yeah, you got, you got to have that, you know, um, but it, you know, similar things, you know, like the cortisones and all of that stuff I, I put in his, in his kit. And, um, I noticed that when I came to get him, um, at the end of the year, most of that stuff was still in there un unwrapped. Like it's just still there, like not used at all. But my daughter, on the other hand, was using everything, you know, like she was consistent and I didn't put any condoms. See, you know, that's kind of that, that gender difference. I didn't put anything like that in her, in her kid. It was like understood. You don't need none of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I did put all of the other things in there, but she used all of it, the cough med, like everything, you know? And so I'm wondering if there's like this big gender differences between, you know, our young scholars in terms of using that stuff. So we give it to them and they don't even use it. Um, and then, you know, they end up bringing it back, which it's not a big deal because it, it can be used, but then it ends up expiring. Now, expired medicines aren't going to kill you. Like they might be a little bit weaker than they used to, but they're probably okay if it's within like six months to a year of the expiration date. Okay. All right. See, that's good to know. That's good to know. Because I know my mom was famous for throwing things away. As soon as she saw an expiration date, it was out of there, you know. And so, you know, knowing like how much time you have after, you know, you see the expiration date on the, on the bottle is really important. Um, so like, I'm, this is still good. <laughs> yeah, right. I can still use it. <laughs> I can still feel it. <laughs> so, so what about, you know, we have a lot of international students that attend our institutions, the institution that I'm, I'm at now. And, and, you know, the one that my, my daughter graduated from, um, what are about those international students, um, and students that are preparing to, to do a semester abroad? What are some advice do you have for them in terms of, you know, medical emergencies and illnesses. So definitely want to make sure you've got a, um, a picture of your insurance cards front and back. So in case mm -hmm. for some reason the actual card gets lost, hopefully you still have your cell phone and then maybe even have a paper copy of it that stays home mm -hmm. of the front and back of it. So that if there's an issue, somebody can give you the information that was on the card. Um, the other thing that's huge is travel insurance, mm -hmm. um, making sure that there's medical coverage in your travel insurance so that, God forbid, there's an emergency, um, your medical care can be covered and they can kind of direct you to the place to go for medical care. And even if you have to be like airlifted to somewhere, that would be included in medical travel insurance. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm going to check in there. And then the same thing as like you will pack a medicine kit for um, students who are going to college. Again, pack the medical kit if they're going abroad. And then um, whether you're going to college um, in, the, in the country or abroad, make sure you have at least three months worth of your prescription medications. Mm. And that's good to know. That's good to know, because typically we would get just 30 <laughs> days and then we get to wherever we're going. Either we lose it or we use it and no, they don't have what you need in those, you know, pharmacies, right. which makes it. Or they may know. have like an alternative or that particular medicine is not available in that country. So I would get a 90 day prescription depending on how long you're going to be gone. Absolutely. So can you share with the, the parents any local resources that their um, scholar can access for free or low cost? Um, in that immediate area? So the, um, the Student Health Center has a plethora of, um, of resources, and I'm going to send you a resource guide that I typed up. Um, the, also, the Student Health Insurance, which is um, United Healthcare, mm -hmm. has a list of resources. There's a list of um, of urgent care uh, places that students can go to. And then there were um, two free clinics that were 
sort of close to the um close to the um uh, office one of them close to the uh college one of them is uh clinica del pueblo which is probably maybe five blocks walking from the um from the college and the other one i can't recall the name of i actually end up leaving my notes to the office today but it's going to be on the resource guide okay awesome Wonderful. And I know that in the chat, you know, we have someone who said um, in terms of the, some of the legal documents we were talking about earlier, the power of attorney, et cetera, um, reference a Berkeley Hill notary service that that's in that area. So if parents are, you know, wondering if there's a notary in that area, um, I'm sure there's hundreds. <laughs> um, but this is one that a parent um, was actually sharing. Um, there is another post about the Chesapeake General Hospital. Um, oh, no, so this was just a comment. All right, so yeah. So yeah, so in terms of the notary, definitely um, uh, for legalizing the, the, the documents, and I don't see any other questions in here. Okay, so. And then um, from what I was looking at, it sounded like you needed to get a document for the state that the student was in and also um, the state that you're in? For, for the, uh, the legal document? All right. Okay, okay, that's good to know as well. And so for the um, United Concordia, you said that that was the in medical insurance that the school um, requires the students to have. Um, right. We know that there's a lot of parents who was really um, frustrated that they had to even invest in that insurance because they have full insurance for their for their kids. You know, what do you know about that particular insurance? And is it is it better to have that insurance? Is, is it just an added level of protection? Or, you know, why do you think that the, the schools are requiring that? So from what I looked into, it sounded like um, all of the health care costs, the things that you get done at the student health center will end up being covered under that insurance, whether you were going to get a physical exam or a TB test or immunizations or labs or HIV and STD testing, pregnancy testing, okay. <laughs> you name it, it seemed to all be covered under that. And then another thing that I thought was interesting was that telehealth or video visits was covered under that. So that was oh, something that students there. could access 24 seven. So the one that was for just plain medical was through Teladoc and the one that was for mental health was uh, better health. Okay. So all of that ended up being free and covered under the plan. Wonderful. Okay. So like, yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> because you know, in certain plans, even the plans that I have, like, you know, you'll get those disclaimers that, you know, this tele, you know, uh, help uh, service may not be covered under your insurance. And you're like, all right, make this call quick, <laughs> you know, because you don't know if it's going to, you know, be taken care of or not. And a lot of the students may not even know that that's an option for them to use that that platform as opposed to actually physically going into a space, especially if you know, they don't have transportation or just don't feel comfortable um, traveling, you know, in that unfamiliar uh, area. That's and then great. that's something where you could contact the doctor if the student health center was closed and you weren't sure whether you should go to the emergency room or not. Um, then you could get advice from the doctor through the telemedicine, telemedicine yeah. visit and they could direct you to higher care if needed. And can they also prescribe um, medicine for you uh, through the telehealth? Um, it, it said that they could prescribe medicine except for controlled substances like narcotic okay. pain medicines. Okay, wonderful. Well, this is great. I don't see um, any additional questions or comments in our chat. I want to double check once again um, in our chat box. Um, do you have any other additional uh, advice or feedback for our parents before we close out our short session for today? Okay, so there's a number of um, community physicians that are either at Howard University Hospital or in DC proper. And I'll put the names of those physicians um, on the uh, resource guide that I'm gonna send you so that you'll be able to um, get in contact with those doctors if you want your, your uh, student to see a physician in the community. Um, and then also, if you're looking for mental health information, this will be on the resource guide too. There's um, a website for you to find um, 
and African American uh, mental health providers. So there's therapy for black girls um, and ther therapy therapy for black girls dot I can't remember which one is dot com and dot org, but there's therapy for black girls and therapy for black men. But it's going to be on the on the resource guide. Which one is the dot com and which one is the dot org for mental, for mental health? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate you uh, giving our parents that time today um, to address some of the concerns that they may be having. And I'm sure that as time goes on, because now we're getting the new freshmen who just received their letter of acceptance. So they're excited and they're coming into the group. Uh, the parents are coming into the group. And so some of them have similar questions as the okay. freshman parents from last year. So I know that we're going to get some additional questions going forward. I hope we can reach out to you again um, to, to uh, engage you in more conversation to help our parents. Um, and we for thank sure. you for Oh, one more thing. Yes. Um, make sure that your students know their medical history and they know their allergies and what actually happened in this allergy because I get so many kids and like, well, what happens if you have penicillin? Oh, let me call my mom. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's good. Like, to what know. if your mom doesn't answer? You need to know what happens to you when you have penicillin. Right, you need right. to know that you don't have an appendix anymore. <laughs> that that is so true. I think that uh, even as they're don't getting older, a lot, <laughs> a lot of them don't know their medical history. They don't even know their parents' medical history. So when they do visit the physician for the first time, they'll ask, you know, is this a medical condition that's, you know, occurs on your mother's side or your father's side? Is it? And they cannot answer any of those questions. So yes, wonderful advice to sit with your student before they leave to kind of go through that, you know, remember some of the questions that are asked of you when you first visit, you know, a doctor in terms of like medical history, because that helps the physician better support you as well as, you know, if they identify uh, an issue or need to diagnose you or prescribe you with medication, they know your family history. And it's, it's uh, better to know that information to help them to give the right medication and to give you the, the right guidance. So great um, feedback and, and uh, suggestions for us. Any other last comments before we close out? Um, no, I think that's it. Yeah, if you awesome. have younger kids, start grooming them as you go to the doctor with them, maybe when they're about 14 or so, and let them start answering the doctor and you can yeah. help them out as needed. You're so right. I can't tell you how many times the doctor would be like, well, so does it, you know, when did this start? And I'll look at my son and be like, tell her. Like, you, don't you, tell her. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know when this happened. <laughs> So yes, <laughs> great advice. Well, thank you, Dr. Hagen, for giving us uh, your time today. We, again, hope to engage you again in the future. Thank you for giving us your time this evening, because I know you could be doing anything tonight, um, and you chose to reconnect with us as an alumni and as someone who is uh, part of the village. So thank you again, and I hope you have an amazing evening. Thank you. You as well. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, no problem.